There could soon be another COVID vaccine option for kids 12 and over in the U.S. This morning, Moderna released the results of its trial on children ages 12 to 17. It claims that the shot is 100% effective in preventing cases two weeks after the second dose. Moderna plans to submit this data to the FDA early next month, which would clear the way for emergency use authorization in the U.S. Founder of Gramercy Pediatrics in New York City, Dr. Diane Hess is with us now to discuss the latest developments. Doctor, thanks for joining us. Um, so how quickly could we see the Moderna shot uh, available for adolescents? And is, is there still a demand? Because we, the Pfizer shot is currently available for that age group. I believe there still is a demand because I don't think every 12 and up has gotten the vaccine, that's for sure. Um, and I think that we can use it also worldwide. So it means that if, you know, if it's amazing that all the 12 and up got it already in the United States, then we can export it. So there's no downside of having two vaccines. Plus, you remember, Moderna is much early, much easier to administer. So for me, as a pediatrician, I can keep Moderna very easily in a regular freezer to vaccinate my patients. I have to say there has been a little bit of a, a hesitancy and a, like some parents are frustrated. They cannot get the Pfizer vaccine in a pediatrics office. They can only get it at a big box pharmacy or a hospital when they really trust their pediatrician. And I have, I have to say, I have one family that's holding out until I can get that Moderna vaccine or Pfizer vaccine in my office because they just really only want to do it in a doctor's office. Their daughter has food allergies. They know that there's an EpiPen at CVS, but they want their pediatrician there. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And as we've seen with this vaccine, that ease of access is, you know, at least one of the deciding factors when it comes to people, you know, getting the shot or not. Um, I know that, or I presume that you were probably <laughs> applauding the news that we heard from New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio that um, New York City schools will be returning 100% to in-person, in-classroom learning, no remote <laughs> option. Because um, I know throughout the year, you've said over and over again that it's better for the kids to be in class. Still, there are parents that are, you know, expressing some concern that they, they wish they had the option of keeping their kids home. Um, so I, I want to ask you, you know, what do you say to those parents that are still concerned about, you know, all of these millions of kids heading back into the classroom? They're still going to have to wear masks and there's still, you know, going to be some things in place to inhibit the spread of uh, the coronavirus vaccine, or for that matter, probably any other illness. But but parents are still very concerned. So what I would say is that we send kids to school every day before the COVID vaccine with millions of other infections out there. There's flu, there's paraflu, there's um, the non-COVID coronavirus, there's enterovirus, rhinovirus, and our kids were fine. And we know that coronavirus was the least lethal to children. I mean, thank God we only had 300 children die in the U.S. 75% of them had comorbidities. So it is really safe to send your kids back to school. Um, remember, the teachers have the option to be vaccinated. You, if your child is 12 and up, you have the option to be vaccinated. And I think by the time school rolls around and maybe even in um, January, the littlest, like six months and up, might be, might be able to be vaccinated. So if you're choosing to keep your kid home, you have to find a different curriculum and you have to homeschool because we cannot split these resources anymore. We cannot have two teachers per classroom, one, mm -hmm. remote, run, one remote, one in school, because we know that kids are not driving the, the, the infection and, we, and the pandemic, and we know that kids are doing really well if they do get it. So your kid is really safe. What I think is happening in New York City is that it's super dangerous, and a lot of kids commute an hour on a subway to get to school. And parents are scared because of crime and they don't want to send their kids. And they've learned that, oh, you know what? If I if I have remote learning, I don't have to worry that my kid is going to get mugged or slashed on the subway. And I think that's a real fear. That is a really interesting observation. And, you know, once again, we see that the coronavirus has also put a spotlight on, you know, problems that were already there beforehand that really need to be addressed. Um, so. The return to in-person learning for many kids will mean no more unlimited screen time for children. Uh, you know, they can kind of get addicted to, to the screens. I, certainly, it's a regular conversation in my house. You know, who's in charge here? Does the iPad control you or do you control the iPad? And I know there are going to be people who don't have children that are going to say, well, just take, take it away from them. It, it's not so easy. Uh, you know, like no. if you take the, the, that, sometimes those iPads help parents out too. So I wonder if you have any suggestions uh, when it comes to helping parents curb their kids' screen time. 
Well, it's kind of one of those things like the cat is out of the bag because we, we've had to use electronics <laughs> to keep these kids calm and entertained and educated for over a year. And now all of a sudden we're telling the kids, you know what? You really need to go outside and ride your bike. You need you really need to go outside and you know run around with your friends in the park. But they're like, oh, you know, there's a you know there's a competition that I have to play online, and if I miss it, I'll, I'll lose my points and I won't earn more points. So it's, it's very hard. Um, so I think kids do really well with like limit setting as far as time. So like I like a timer or you know this is a time you have 30 minutes to play Minecraft now, and when that 30 minutes is up, this Minecraft goes off. If you if you don't set limits like that or whatever your limit is, it, it sets it up that there's like there's never ending because then there's never an end because these games literally never end. They're designed to keep your kids obsessed. And I can tell you as a doctor that I see patients now who are one years old who know how to turn on their iPhone or their parents' iPhone while they're waiting for their vaccines. They look at videos of Coco Melon and whatever the popular thing is, and they're one. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of backpedaling to do to get these kids off. And this summer is really our time to do it. Yeah, I think it's a great point. Uh, you know, if you let kids know ahead of time, they can handle the expectations. It's when sort of they're in midstream and you grab it and take away, take it away from them, then you get, you know, a world war in the house. Um, that whole conversation that you just you just sort of went through about going to the park versus, you know, losing your points, had that conversation. It's like you have listening devices in my house. I've had that conversation so many times. Um, updated mask guidance has kind of been a little confusing for adults, but it could be even more confusing for kids. Uh, they're seeing some people people, you know, who are using masks, some people are not using masks. Um, what are children being told to do? Children are still, in New York State for sure, children over age two are still supposed to mask, especially the ones who are unvaccinated. Now, the vaccinated children can be unmasked when they're outdoors or indoors with other vaccinated children. So if you have your vaccine, you can be with other children who are vaccinated, but there's no way to know in a classroom, let's say, who is vaccinated and who is not at this point. So in schools, the kids are required to wear their masks. There are probably many unvaccinated children around them. But it's confusing. And there's a, you know, they say, like, if it's very crowded outside, then you should wear your mask. I, I, I go with common sense. I think that is like, I think that um, guideline that they put out is very wishy-washy and it's putting too much onus on the parents mm. to figure out what is right. I think that you have to use common sense that if your child is young and not immunized and playing outside for now, they should still wear their mask if they're with like kids crowded, like if they're all huddling around an art project. But if they're playing kickball or if they're you know running and doing tag, I think that's fine. It's up to parents to use their judgment. I have to say, I still see most kids in New York City wearing their mask in the park. And I, I think they just have grown to tolerate it. They, they know that it's expected of them. But indoors, kids who are unimmunized should be wearing masks, as well as adults. Yeah. You you know, we in this house, we grab the mask as soon as we walk out the door. And then, you know, no matter what circumstances we find ourselves in, we are prepared. Mask up or mask down. Um, Dr. Diane Hess, thank you so much. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. So the White House COVID-19 response team will hold a briefing later today. You can stream it live here on CBSN at 1.30 p.m. Eastern.